Iranian nuclear weapons development. They have turned the island into a communist hellhole. The experiment in Venezuela has failed completely. La bestialidad imperialista. Bestialidad que no tiene una frontera determinada ni pertenece a un país determinado. Bestias fueron las hordas hitleristas, como bestias son los norteamericanos hoy, como bestias son los paracaidistas belgas, como bestias fueron los imperialistas franceses en Argelia. Porque es la naturaleza del imperialismo la que bestializa a los hombres, la que la convierte en fieras sedientas de sangre que están dispuestas a degollar, a asesinar, a destruir hasta la última imagen de un revolucionario, de un partidario de un régimen que haya caído bajo su bota o que luche por su libertad. Y la estatua que recuerda a Lumumba, hoy destruida pero mañana reconstruida, nos recuerda también en la historia trágica de ese mártir de la revolución del mundo, que no se puede confiar en el imperialismo, pero ni tantito así, nada. Long live the Ansar Allah movement, long live the Yemeni resistance to Saudi aggression, to imperialism, to Zionism, long live the resistance of the brave and heroic Yemeni people, one of the most impoverished countries in the world because of capitalism and imperialism, resisting empire in all forms and liberating their country from foreign invaders. What's up, everybody? Welcome to episode 68, Unmasking Imperialism exposing imperialist propaganda in mainstream media. And today we are focusing on the axis of resistance in the Middle East. We're going to be highlighting resistance movements in Iran, Iraq, Lebanon, Syria, and Yemen. 
and why it's important for the international left, the Marxist-Leninist left, the socialist movement to stand in solidarity with the axis of resistance that is actually in real life on the front lines now today, bearing the brunt of the struggle against Wahhabi terrorism, Zionism, and all forms of aggression. We're going to talk about how Shia Islamic and Baathist movements are on the front lines of the fight against empire and why we as communists should stand in support and in solidarity, in particular with Yemen and especially with Yemen, because I feel on the left, Yemen never gets a lot of the attention and focus it deserves, uh, even though it's one of the worst, if not the worst, humanitarian crisis that's going on today because of empire. And joining me today is a comrade I, I've been following for quite some time who I really enjoy his work. He has a fantastic channel called The Oriental Despot. Please subscribe to Jay Therapel's channel, The Oriental Despot. Jay is a PhD candidate who's currently studying theories of imperialism as they relate to the wars of the 21st century in the Arab world. Jay's re other research interests cover such topics as the nature of currency, hegemony, and post-colonial critiques of Marxist theory. Jay advocates for the Yemeni national resistance and is part of the hands-off Syria movement in Sydney, Australia. Shout out to everybody in Australia. Shout out to uh, David Fox, who's a comrade out there in Australia. Uh, and please subscribe to the Oriental Despot. How's it going, Brother Jay? I'm well, thank you. Um, I've been watching your show, Unmasking Imperialism, for a while now. I, I've got to say I've learned a lot about uh, what's happening over in Latin America, particularly Nicaragua, uh, which is the country in Latin America that we don't hear much about. We hear a lot about Cuba, not enough about Nicaragua. So thank you for that content. Much appreciated. Yeah, thanks, man. I appreciate it. And I love the name of your channel, Oriental Despot, because it's one of those names that a lot of the chauvinistic Western left will use against leaders from the global South who are communists and tries to slander them. And it's a beautiful way to embrace it and to, to use appropriate for the liberations of our movements. And the access to resistance I find really fascinating. I remember in 2011, the Arab Spring or the Arab Sting, as some people call it, all these protests going on. And I found it interesting after that time period, learning more about Iran, learning more about uh, Hezbollah, learning more about uh, Ansarullah in Yemen, and also learning about Iraq and the Islamic movement there. And even though, and th this is also around the time that I was becoming more of a communist, I was studying Marx and Lenin. And at that time, I met a lot of so-called communists or leftists, in particular, a lot of Trotskyists who rejected Iran, who rejected Syria, who repeated a lot of the State Department imperialist talking points about Assad and, and Khomeini and uh, Ahmadinejad and, and all of these different movements. And I was really disappointed by that because I'm seeing what these countries are doing, resisting empire, uh, especially at this, at this time, in particular Syria as well, that was under the limelight from uh, the Obama administration. They were claiming that Assad was gassing his own people and all this nonsense. And I knew from the get-go, like we're seeing right now with Russia and Ukraine, that this was a mass propaganda psychological operation to try to drum a, a war, a support for war against Syria. And I learned about the axis of resistance. And it reminded me a lot about the axis of resistance in Latin America that we see with Cuba, Venezuela, Nicaragua, Bolivia, and, and now other countries that are moving to the left as well. And I felt, wow, like th this is so important to support because it's actually existing resistance to the empire. And there was this sort of discrepancy that I came across where you had these extremely puritanical communist ultra left who didn't want to support any of the access to resistance forces because they didn't necessarily adhere to Marxism, Leninism or socialism. But then you have these groups in the Middle East that aren't necessarily Marxist per se, but they're speaking very much like communists they're talking about the empire you know instead of uh the great imperialist power the great satan uh you know they're talking about the evils of of financial capitalism and usury they're talking about saudi arabia and its crimes and israel's and its crimes they're actually resisting these forces on the front lines and i felt that to be really inspiring and beautiful and it was eye-opening to me because it was a chance for me to understand that as a communist it's not our job to only support communist movements but movements that are in real life 
resisting empire regardless of whatever branding or name they have so uh, before we get into some of the different specific regions of the middle east and the access to resistance jay uh, maybe why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got into learning about it studying it and any general thoughts you have on the axis of resistance uh yeah sure i mean i uh i first got involved in agitating against the war on syria back in 2012 uh which is when i started putting myself out there as a public figure uh, I started paying attention to the war in Yemen in 2018, and that's because I saw a comment on my wall, uh, and it was from a Yemeni who said words to the effect of, you know, you write about Syria a lot, but could you please write about Yemen? Our people are suffering. And that really hit me because I didn't know enough about Yemen. So I spent the next uh, six, seven, eight months just reading and researching about Yemen so that I could actually advocate for their cause. Uh, and it's true. I mean, the people of Yemen have suffered the worst humanitarian crisis for the past seven, eight years. Uh, 377,000 Yemenis have died. Um, and that's because the Saudis are using starvation as a, as a weapon of war. So I spent months researching it. I gave over a dozen interviews about Yemen with, uh, with Marwa Usman from, from Press TV, who's also a friend of mine. Uh, and I also made two videos about uh, the history of Yemen in early 2020, which you can find on my YouTube channel. Um, I've written about 17 articles about Yemen. It's it's on my website, theorientaldespot.com. Um, and, you know, last year in August, I wrote a piece for The Cradle titled uh, Why a Checkmate is Looming for the Saudis in Yemen. Uh, so now that I've pretty much finished writing my PhD thesis, I hope to have more time doing media work like you. Cool. That's awesome, man. I grew up with a lot of Yemenis in New York. I'm born and raised in New York, but I live in Los Angeles now. And I remember going into a bodega one time in new york a lot of bodegas are owned the grocery the corner stores are owned by yemenis and i remember seeing this one yemeni guy who had the, the flag uh the the green and the red the answer law flag and i don't think anybody else kind of understood what that was and i understood it and i was like oh okay this guy um you know this guy knows the stuff or this guy's like active politically uh, and it's a very working class humble people a lot of the yemenis i've met and it's so important to have that international solidarity with Yemen, because like you said, it doesn't get the attention it deserves a lot of times. And there's so much crazy shit. Every time I see videos or images about Yemen, uh, it's so infuriating to see to see what they're doing. Um, so starting off chronologically, right, because we're kind of tackling a big topic, which is the axis of resistance, which encompasses several different movements in different countries. So the five main areas of focus that were highlighting today are the Baathist movement in Syria. Even today, President Bashar al-Assad, the democratically elected president, he is part of the, the Baath party. And Baathism is a tradition that goes for many years, not just in Syria, but uh, in, in all parts of uh, the Middle East, the Arab world. Um, also, we're going to be talking about uh, Iran and the Islamic Revolution of 1929, which in many ways was crucial. In many ways, was like the Cuban Revolution of the axis of resistance that's sort of what it represents for for that region uh and then we're also going to talk about uh hezbollah in lebanon the lebanese resistance movement founded in 1982 and how hezbollah has resisted actively on the front lines bravely against israel the zionist invaders and has defended uh arabs and all peoples against the idf uh also as we mentioned ansar Allah, the party of uh the champions of god uh, in yemen who have been resisting Saudi aggression for many years, uh, in particular within these last 10 years, and who are leading a very popular and organized movement in Yemen. Uh, and lastly, the popular mobilization forces in Iraq, which began organizing, especially after the US invasion. And we can talk about the Iraqi uh, Shia militias and how they've cooperated in with Iran and Hezbollah and other groups to defeat ISIS and Daesh and all these other Wahhabi groups. Um, so just to start off with Baathism in Syria, one of the things, uh, just to quickly go over, uh, the Arab Socialist Baath Party uh, was founded by Michel Aflaq and several others uh, in 1947. And the name of uh, Baath means Renaissance or Resurrection. And it is a combination, it's a synthesis of Arab nationalism, Pan-Arabism, uh, Arab socialism, anti-imperialism, and many other things. And Baathism, in a way, can be compared to Bolivarianism in Latin America, which calls for the unification of the Arab world into a single state or a single entity that cooperates and trades with each other, one people, because the Arab people are one people, even though 
we have these artificial borders that were designed by the imperialists uh, in the first and second world wars. The motto of the Ba'ath Party is unity, liberty, socialism. And in a way, this was a resistance to Zionism. We have to remember that the state of Israel was founded in 1948 by the imperialists, by uh, Theodore Herzl, the, his ideas, and all these uh, wealthy billionaires. Uh, and after the Balfour Declaration in, in the early 1900s. So in a way, Ba'athism and Arab nationalism was in response to this rising threat of Zionism, which was a beachhead for imperialism and neocolonialism in the region. Uh, and Syria has been one of the, the countries on, at the forefront for many years, the, the Assad family maintaining uh, Ba'athism in Syria. And uh, Assad in particular has been targeted by a lot of Western imperialist maneuvers and operations, false flag attacks, media slanders. We all remember 2013, 2014, when it felt like we were on the brink of war with Syria and invading Syria and all of this that proved to be nonsense. So what I'm going to do is I want to play a clip. Uh, this is, again, right, we're going to be debunking some of the common propaganda talking points about the different legs of the axis of resistance. And this video is called How Bashar al-Assad Destroyed Syria uh, by Now This World uh, 2015. Again, keep in mind that Assad has one of the highest approval ratings of most presidents in the world. Uh, the Syrian people love him. Uh, and of all backgrounds, not just Shia, Islam, uh, Sunni, Christians, everybody. Um, so I'm going to play this clip and then we'll talk to Jay about what is actually, to, to give us a rundown of what actually Ba'athism represents in Syria and how it's different from the, the mainstream media propaganda. As Syria struggles through an ongoing civil war and the terrorist group ISIS spreads through the region, there seems to be one person being blamed for the significant decline of the Middle Eastern country, Bashar al-Assad. So is Assad destroying Syria? Well, Syria was already suffering from a dynastic authoritarian regime since Assad's father seized power in the 1970s in a coup d'etat. When Bashar took over as the nepotistic ruler of Syria in 2000, he continued his father's repressive regime. He instigated severe crackdowns on any political dissent, private or public. The resulting backlash forced him to release a number of political prisoners to ease tensions, but it didn't work. By 2011, when much of the Arab world was revolting during the Arab Spring, Assad authorized the release of a significant number of terrorist leaders from prison. These terrorists would soon after regroup to form ISIS. This, coupled with violent crackdowns on protesters, turned the Arab Spring into an armed rebellion by the Syrian opposition, pitting the Sunni Muslim majority against Assad's Alawite Shia minority. As the civil war progressed, Assad continued arresting citizens and was personally implicated in a number of war crimes by the UN, including the imprisonment and killing of his own citizens. By 2015, some 200,000 political prisoners alone had been jailed for speaking out against the regime. Although most of the Arab League, along with the US and EU, have demanded that Assad step down as president, he instead ran for a third term in 2014. His victory was widely considered illegitimate and the vote it's faked or coerced. Recent reports suggest that Assad has been assisting ISIS militarily in their spread across Syria. In the meantime, Assad's actions have forced 6.5 million residents out of their homes and 3 million out of the country, as well as decimating the economy and military. Reports say that Syria would not return to pre-civil war conditions for another 30 years at least, following the end of the conflict. In short, Bashar al-Assad is not only destroying Syria, but essentially helped facilitate the formation and rise of ISIS. To learn about where they're going, check out our video. Nine and a half million Syrians have been forced to flee their homes. Over three million of those have fled the country. There's a link to that video in the description below. Thanks so much for watching Testu News. I like how they put music that you would use for a video, like an Etsy video, like how to make pancakes. It's like, dun, 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 like the piano. <laughs> Uh, and then they have some like disgusting imperialist lies about Syria, blaming, they blame Assad basically for creating ISIS. Can you believe that? They say that the, the yeah. guy who's responsible for fighting and leading the fight against Daesh ISIS is the person responsible for creating them. And they also blame the exodus of migrants from Syria on Assad. Uh, Jay, tell us what's really going on and the significance of uh, Ba'athism in Syria and why it's important for uh, communists to defend Syria.
Well, thank you for ruining my morning by making me have to watch that. But, uh, <laughs> uh, look, if we're going to respond to that point by point, I jotted down a few things, and after that, we'll talk about Baathism. Um, they said that uh, Syria was suffering from a dynastic authoritarian regime. Now, authoritarian as it might be, you cannot be a resistant state and a liberal democracy at the same time when you have Israel to one side, Turkey to the other side, and they're both breathing down your neck, and the United States has designated your country as part of the axis of evil since 2003. You simply cannot be a liberal democracy. That's number one. Secondly, um, it may have been dynastic and authoritarian, but let's not forget that despite Syria having a per capita income of around two to three thousand um, uh, dollars in terms of life expectancy, education, health care, uh, rights for women, Syria was right up there in the Arab world, despite not having all of the privileges of being a protectorate like uh, like Qatar, it had many of the same living standards as Qatar. And let's not forget that Qatar is basically like a, like a slave state, you know, like the majority of the population are immigrants from uh, countries like South Asia or countries in South Asia, rather. Um, so that's the second point. Uh, you mentioned the releasing of prisoners, right? I mean, well, the irony in that video, in that very video is that they said that in the beginning, you know, uh, uh, the, the protests called for the releasing of political prisoners. And then they say Assad is responsible for releasing prisoners who then turned into ISIS. Now, I've actually done some research on this. And there were about six or seven. I can't remember the names now. I mean, if you had asked me about three or four years ago, I'd be able to rattle, rattle them off off the top of my head. Uh, but there were about six or seven people that, that were released in those uh, prisoner exchanges back in 2011. And uh, the, the majority of them, five of them, ended up um, joining the so-called moderate groups, you know, like Ahrar al-Sham, Jaysh al-Islam. Uh, only like one or two ended up joining Islamic State. Uh, but the thing is, that's what the, the, the protesters were demanding. That's what the, 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 the West was demanding. That's what the Muslim Brotherhood was demanding. The Saudis, like every country that was against Syria, the NATO, GCC, Axis, was demanding that, Israel, that, that Syria uh, release these uh these prisoners and then some of them ended up joining the insurgency against the syrian government i mean they also mentioned that the un and the eu demanded that assad step down i mean i don't think that's true for the un like i think that's i think they're pulling i think that's a prevarication because the un really it's not there because like if anything uh, from memory i think uh they they were pushing for like you know dialogue and things like that right I and mean, for like reform and getting the different parties together uh to be like a kind of arbitrator um, but then, you know, the EU, I mean, who are they to demand that Assad steps down? That's for the Syrian people to decide. Um, they mentioned that act uh, Assad's actions in forcing 6 million refugees to leave. What about the economic sanctions on Syria? Like, right. you know, the economic sanctions on Syria are causing uh, food prices to go up. They're causing a lack of medicines. Obviously, under those conditions, people are going to leave. And the EU has been playing the cynical game where they want the Syrian state to collapse. And so they open their borders to refugees from Syria. And so, you know, these poor refugees, these people in Syria are, are faced with a choice. Do they stay in Syria, possibly get conscripted into the Syrian army to fight against ISIS? Um, or do they do they leave to, to greener pastures in, in Europe? Uh, and, you know, the Israelis have been facilitating this. A lot of Israeli NGOs have been behind this, uh, <laughs> this, this pressure campaign on the EU to let in these refugees. A lot of right-wingers say it. They're not wrong. Um, and finally, the rise of ISIS. I mean, did the, you're ignoring the elephant in the room, which is that, uh, you know, Saudi Arabia has been the major funder of Islamic State. Um, there's just so much evidence that Turkey has been funding them as well. The arms shipments that came from Libya to Turkey that, uh, that were sent there by the CIA and MI6 ended up in the hands of, of, uh, of the, the Turkish government, which then gave it to anyone who was willing to fight the Syrian government. Once these people crossed the borders into Syria with their arms, they were free to join whatever militia they liked. And Islamic State was uh, was the group that was the most um, organized on the ground because after 2013, 2014, they had seized control of all the oil fields in northern Syria. I mean, that's because of the weakness of the Syrian state. And, and it's the NATO GCC Israeli axis that's contributed to destabilizing and weakening the Syrian state. And so they're the ones that are responsible for the rise of ISIS, not the Syrian president, Bashar al-Assad. Uh, did you want me uh, to go such a, Yeah, now, so that's, that's such, a, such a great rundown. And before you do, what I want to do is uh, I just want to share uh, an image that I saw. This image really put things in perspective for me. You know, they say uh, Assad is not in any way popular. 
the people he's unliked and he has no rule. And this image that we're looking at, for those of you listening, there's literally like millions of people out in the streets of Damascus, which is the oldest inhabited city in the world, by the way. A lot of beautiful city I'd love to go to one day. Uh, uh, at an Assad rally, millions of people. You can't tell me that all these people are paid or were forced to go there. You know, who's going to be the person that's putting them at gunpoint? Who's How much money are they going to be paying people for that? Um, and I think these images, you're never going to see that in mainstream media. And it just represents the popularity of Assad. And um, I think another thing that I want to share as well is also his international uh, solidarity. This is an image of the late Venezuelan President Hugo Chavez uh, with uh, President Bashar al-Assad that says, uh, welcome to Venezuela, President of the Arab Republic of Syria, Bashar al-Assad. Uh, Hugo Chavez is somebody who firmly stood with uh, President Assad and the, the Syrian people against empire. Uh, and I'm glad you did that, um, Comrade Jay. I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about the, the roots and origins of Baathism as well and why it's something that communists and leftists should support now uh, historically and in the present yeah i mean you know the the bathists they have their their roots in in the peasantry and in the working class and so whenever people say that syria is a dictatorship i mean they're they're not wrong insofar as you know the bath party historically did have a political monopoly over the constitution but all of that changed in 2012 um, because previously the way that it worked is that if you were uh, an alternative political party, you needed to have the permission of the Ba'ath Party, uh, or you could be an independent. You know, other than that, uh, uh, what people forget is that in the according to the Syrian Constitution, fifty percent of the seats in Parliament are reserved for workers and farmers. You know, wow. so this is something you don't see in the United States. You know, yeah. you don't see these provisions. After 2012, they eliminated the uh, the, the formal political monopoly that uh, the Ba'ath Party had. So now uh, Syria is technically a just another liberal democracy. Okay, it's not liberal. I mean, it's still authoritarian. But like, you can have authoritarian measures enacted by a democracy because the population feels that it's necessary to counter an external threat. But simply because a country is authoritarian doesn't mean it's not a democracy. So Syria has right. actually become like a, like a pluralistic democracy from 2012 onwards in ways that it wasn't before. In the past, the way that it operated is that um, the Ba'ath Party would, would select its own internal candidate for the president of the country, and that president would run unopposed in a plebiscite. And so people would be able to vote yes or no. You know, do you want Hafez al-Assad to continue being the president, yes or no? Um, so in 2014, I mean, they showed this in that clip, uh, the, because they changed the constitution, they had for the first time uh, under Ba'ath rule, under like since the, the Ba'ath revolution, um, a multi-candidate election and Bashar al-Assad won. I mean, they forget that part. You know, it's like, yeah, there was a multi-candidate yeah. election, but like Assad won, you know, and that's yeah. because, you know, during times of war, most countries are not keen on changing the leader. That's like a normal thing everywhere. I think that's a great analysis because... A lot of times people equate a quote unquote liberal democracy with having a new leader every four years. And in my home country of Honduras, where the people are living in complete impoverishment, there has been crime, murder, it's extremely colonized, oppressed nation, one of the poorest in the Western Hemisphere. We've had presidents every four years. It's a revolving door of leaders who come in and out and people around the world prefer stability. It's like I, I compare it to a flight. If you're taking a long flight, let's say I'm going to visit you. You know, you're in Australia. I'm in Los Angeles and Cali. If there, that's a pretty long flight, right? If if that flight had like five different pilots rotating every hour, I'd be kind of you know a little concerned. But if we had one good pilot who knew what the hell they were doing for the whole flight, I'm cool with that because what I want is stability. I want that flight to be as smooth as possible without any bumps. And I think that's what people in the West fail to understand that in many of these countries, like you said, where they're not allowed to even have stability and peace, like stability and peace is impossible when you're surrounded by all these imperialist forces that are undermining and destabilizing your nation. The people want peace and stability. And that's what Assad has been able to deliver. And I think the Western liberal the cafe latte socialists are just unable to understand that they just see 
a strong man, they see a strong leader and they're like so adverse to that, you know, um, and, and it's so interesting. Um, just kind of changing gears a little bit, you know, moving into now the 1970s, you have, of course, the Iranian Islamic Revolution that took place and overthrew Shah Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, Pahlavi and replaced a monarchical, like outdated, reactionary, pro-imperialist government with a Islamic revolution. And it's important to mention that the Iranian revolution itself was supported by a lot of leftists and communist groups at the time. Unfortunately, you know, there were some contradictions that played out, but overall it was popularly supported by the masses. And in a way, we can't talk about 1979, the revolution, without talking about the 1953 U.S.-backed orchestrated coup against Mossadegh that was who was trying to nationalize the oil, who's trying to bring about progressive reforms in the country. And basically, this Shah Reza Pahlavi was installed, his family dynasty, wealthy as hell, very right wing, very allied with Zionism and imperialism. And so basically, this revolution had been boiling for many years up until 1979, uh, when Ayatollah Khomeini came back to Iran after being exiled for many years and established the Islamic Revolution. And even though Iran doesn't necessarily define itself as Marxist or socialist, they at the time said neither uh, capitalism nor socialism, but Islam. Uh, I'm cool with that, because if you look at a lot of the things that the Iranian Revolution established, there are things that are in line with what we want as communists, Liter uh, the ability of women to go to school and educate and learn, uh, rights for the working class and the poor. The Islamic revolution of Iran in many ways was a revolution of the poor people of the working class and also uh, in many ways was against empire, calling out U.S. imperialism, calling out war, uh, calling out parasitic capitalism, banking institutions, outlawing usury, outlawing uh, these different practices that were exploiting the masses, uh, reappropriating the wealth of the bourgeoisie for the poor. So even though in appearance it didn't have a socialist label, didn't have a hammer and sickle, in many ways the Islamic revolution of Iran did things that were really great for the working class of not just Iran, but also for the region as a whole, inspiring the most oppressed peoples. So I'm going to play a clip. This is from uh, Jay, your favorite media outlet, Radio Free Europe, uh, it's called the uh, 1979 Iran Revolution, how it happened. Uh, a, a bourgeois media source, of course, uh, their breakdown of what the Iranian revolution was. So I'm going to play this and then we'll talk about what Iran represents in the axis of resistance. 40 years ago, Shiit Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini spearheaded a revolution that deposed the monarchy in Iran. In its place arose an Islamic Republic. A repressive theocracy had replaced an authoritarian monarchy. And almost overnight, Iran had been transformed from a crucial U.S. ally into a bitter opponent. Here are some of the key dates that led to the revolution. From 1941 to 1979, Mohammad Reza Shah Pahlavi, a close partner of the United States, had ruled Iran. He modernized Iran while forcefully suppressing dissent and political freedoms. The clergy opposed the Shah's social and economic reforms. Discontent grew until, in 1978, anti-Shah demonstrations spread across the mostly Shia country. Strikes and mass protests erupted, and accusation flew that the Shah was the U.S. puppet. Martial law was imposed. Cassette tapes of speeches by the 76-year-old Khomeini were smuggled into the country, fueling the unrest. Many Iranians took to their rooftops at night to shout, Allahu Akbar, or God is great, to express their protest. On January 16, 1979, the Shah left Iran for what was officially a vacation. Many Iranians rejoiced with chants of, the Shah is gone. The man who'd ruled the country for 37 years would never return from exile, dying some 13 months later. On February 1st, a crowd of around 3 million people in Tehran welcomed Khomeini's return from 14 years of exile. Asked about his feelings, the Islamic revivalist famously gave a cryptic one-word answer, nothing. Finally, on February 11th, the revolutionaries declared victory after Iran's demoralized armed forces declared neutrality. The monarchy was suddenly gone. Deadly factionalism followed, but Khomeini held the upper hand. 
and in April, following a nationwide referendum, an Islamic Republic was officially proclaimed, eventually with Khomeini at its apex. Thousands of Shah era officials and other Iranians would be executed following summary trials. Student revolutionaries would storm the U.S. embassy, taking dozens hostage. Tehran would doggedly pursue anti-Western policies for decades to come. The revolution's 40th anniversary arrives at a critical juncture for the Islamic Republic, hobbled by U.S. sanctions in fighting and the frustration of a restless young populace, most of whom were born after the revolution. Some regime insiders have warned recently that the Islamic establishment could collapse. Even one of Khomeini's own grandsons warned there is no guarantee that this system his grandfather created would survive. Despite such speculation, it is clear that the clerical establishment remains firmly in place. So there you have our favorite media outlet, Radio Free Europe, talking trash about the Islamic Revolution. By the way, shout out to Comrade David. David said, I like uh, Ramiro and I like a good latte. Not quite sure where this puts me politically. Lattes are the primary contradiction. They've surpassed imperialism. So if you're pro latte, you're not a comrade of mine. No, I'm just talking with you. Uh, I like lattes too. They just happen to be what a lot of the imperialist, liberal, Trotskyist left like to drink at coffee shops while talking about the Frankfurt School and postmodernism. So <laughs> that's why I uh, refer to them as latte liberals. But uh, comrade Jay, you know that that video we were watching. They're talking. I think it, interestingly enough, it wasn't as much of a hit piece against Iran, but a lot of the propaganda, like I live out here in LA, they call it uh, Tarangelis, like Tehran, yeah. Los Angeles, the Shahs of Sunset. And me and uh, Ophelia, my girlfriend, we we come across these counter-revolutionary Iranians all the time. First of all, they don't even call themselves Iranian, they call themselves Persian, and they hate being called Iranian. And a lot of them are very reactionary, very wealthy, very right-wing, and they make it seem like Iran was this paradise, this amazing, beautiful paradise before the revolution. Uh, maybe it was a paradise for a handful of people for the Pahlavi dynasty, but not for the majority of the masses. And they just seem to use the same argument that a lot of right wing Venezuelans say that, you know, Venezuela was this oil rich paradise before the Bolivarian revolution and now it's horrible. Uh, so there's a lot of that propaganda against Iran. But in many ways, the Iranian revolution was sort of the centerpiece, the the Cuban revolution, so to speak, of the axis of resistance that allowed for many of these other movements to grow and rise uh, in different parts of the region. So your overall thoughts on the Iranian revolution, the significance of it, and why communists and leftists should continue to defend Iran today? Yeah, I think the word defend is correct more than, more than support, because I have some complicated uh, opinions about... Uh, the Iranian revolution, particularly the Iran-Iraq war that started afterwards, which I don't solely blame on Iraq. I think that both countries were in many ways responsible. Iran wanted to export its revolution into Iraq, which has a huge Shia population. All of the important uh, sites of Shia Islam, like Kufa, Najaf, are in Iraq. Um, and so that uh, represented uh, a threat to the to the Baathist government, and they decided to punch first. On top of that, Iraq was saying that the that they wanted the Shat al Arab. They wanted one waterway to be able to ship their oil, um, and the Iranians were saying that it belonged to them, even though they had an entire coastline. And uh, you know, Iran had a history of supporting you know Kurdish rebellions in Iraq. I mean, the Kurds are also a fellow Iranic people. Uh, so that's complicated. I see two post-colonial nations that are just wasting each other for eight years. And uh, the United States was uh, benefiting from supporting both sides. I think uh, Khomeini, uh, Iraq actually wanted to end the war in 1982. Khomeini just continued it. And the only reason that the war ended is because Saddam used chemical weapons against the Iranians. So that was just like a tragedy all around. But I will say this, um, <clears throat> the, you know, the reason why the U.S. hates Iran is, I think, more important if you live in the West, because it's the West that wants to sanction Iran, that wants to punish Iran. And why? Because Iran supports countries in the region that are resisting Israel, like Hezbollah is like the, the foremost example of this. Now, Iran's trying to support the Yemeni resistance, but it's very difficult because of the blockade. Um, and that's why the West hates Iran. I mean, when people say to me, I get a lot of letters who say this, they say, look, if you were, if you were around in Iran, after the revolution, as a communist, you'd probably be killed. And I say, yeah, it's, it's, it's probably true. Because there were two forces that were trying to 
trying to steer the revolution, right? You had communists and then you had um, the, the, the Shia Islamists and the Shia Islamists won and they carried out a massacre against the communists. I mean, do you really think the communists would have been any different had they seized power? But I would say this, that had the communists seized power, the, the hostility that they would have faced from the United States would have been exactly the same because U.S. hostility towards a country is entirely because of its economic policies and its foreign policies. Economic policies like resource nationalization in the case of Iraq and foreign policies like supporting regional resistance to Israel and the United States, which is what Iran has done. And it's for that reason that I defend Iran. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the contradictions. I think that's important to mention as well, because the Iran-Iraq war and the contradictions between the left and the Islamic Revolution in 1929, they're important to study. And I'll admit myself, I don't fully know a lot of it. I know some of the basics of the two-day party, the masses party, and some of what happened. I've also heard, um, correct if I'm wrong, I'm also heard, I've also heard that at one point, the U.S. basically funded or su tacitly supported a lot of ultra leftists in Iran who they were trying to use to attack the Islamic Revolution and create chaos. And that in, in many ways, like just because somebody has the name communist or Marxist or they identify with that um, doesn't necessarily mean that they're fighting against imperialism, so to speak. It's kind of like when we see these articles about China that say, you know, China jails Marxists and you're like, so the Western left were like, oh, that's horrible. I'm a Marxist, right? But then you look into mm. it and it's like, who are these Marxists? And we see this happening as well in Nicaragua. And, and that's one of the tactics of the color revolutions, the, the imperialism, is that like in Nicaragua with the right wing uh, Contras, now they're calling themselves Sandinista, but they're saying they're even more to the left than the ruling Sandinista mm. party. They're like, we're the real, you know, the real leftists, but we're opposing we just so happen to be opposing a leftist government and we just so happen to be aligning ourselves with empire. Um, and, you know, I yeah. suspect there's some of that as well that has happened uh, in Iran. Uh, I have to do some more research on that, but uh, I'm glad you mentioned the importance of the need to defend Iran, because like you said, they have been on the front lines resisting uh, Israel, resisting Zionism, resisting imperialism. And without Iran, I think the middle, the Israeli Zionists, would have expanded their vision of uh, the United Kingdom of Israel going back to biblical times, this imperialist project that they have going from Egypt, the Nile River, all the way to the Tigris and Euphrates River, basically controlling that region. That is the grand vision of people like Netanyahu controlling that whole region. Uh, and if it weren't for Iran, I think uh, it would have been a lot easier for uh, Israel to do that. Um, and Iran as well, I think it's important to mention even today, despite being sanctioned, despite being blockaded by U.S. imperialism, Western imperialism, Iran has been defending countries around the world, Venezuela, bringing oil refinery systems engineers to Venezuela to help process the oil, bringing trade to countries like Nicaragua, to Cuba. If it weren't for Iran, a lot of the Latin American socialist countries wouldn't have the support and economic stability that they have today. So I think it's something that's important to mention, you know, that even the socialist countries are working with Iran. Yeah. I mean, you don't need to be a socialist country to be anti-imperialist. They're two very different right. things. And I think this has yep. to be kind of very explicitly stated uh, because, you know, the imperialism, as I understand it, based on the work that I've done, is uh, is the simple fact that uh, the United States, because it's got the world hegemonic currency, it inherits an interest in keeping uh, the rest of the world poor, and it sees Russia as a country that's helping the rest of the world economically, even by serving its own interests. Russia's going around serving its own interests. But these mutually beneficial relations are undermining the patterns of trade inherited by the United States from Britain, which were founded on the systems of extractive uh, colonialism, that is simply extracting wealth from India, the West Indies and other countries, particularly in Africa, and before that, you know, uh, from slavery in the Americas, right? And so, you know, countries don't have to be socialist to undermine this imperialist interest of keeping the rest of the world poor. That has to be, I think, very, very clearly stated. Yeah, no, definitely. And in 1982, just a few years after the Iranian Revolution, you have the creation of Hezbollah, the party of God, party of Allah. And <clears throat> excuse me, Hezbollah is a Lebanese Shia uh, uh, Islamic uh, political party 
led by Secretary General Hassan Nasrallah since 1992. And Hezbollah, based in Lebanon, has lead has mm -hmm. led the military force against the Israeli Zionist invaders. Uh, in 1982, after the invasion, Hezbollah became very popular, especially among the poor and working class people in Lebanon, and successfully fought off and defeated a lot of the IDF and the Israeli soldiers that have all this fancy equipment and money from Washington. So it's very inspiring to see that a group like the Lebanese resistance, like Hezbollah is able, a ragtag group of, you know, working class people inspired by the Iranian revolution are able to defeat a well-armed, well-trained, powerful entity like Israel. And uh, Hezbollah has for many years since 1982 also helped other groups in the region, especially fighting against uh, radical Wahhabi, uh, Sunni fundamentalism, like we see, I, I think a lot of this, like you said, Jay, earlier on, has to be posited within the scope of Saudi Arabia and Wahhabi. You know, you have Ibn, I, mm. I, I can't pronounce his name, but it's like Ibn al-Wahhab, who was like this uh, very reactionary Muhammad scholar. Ibn -Wahhab, yeah. There you go. You did a mu much better job of pronouncing it than I did. But basically, he, to my understanding, he's like favors a very strict interpretation of, of Sunni Islam, very reactionary. Uh, and it, it's the House of Saud, the the fam, the, ru yeah. the ruling family of Saudi Arabia, basically adopted this ideology of Wahhabism, which doesn't even <laughs> necessarily represent Islam as a whole, but it's just like a very fundamentalist sect of it. Um, yeah. Made it the ruling ideology of Saudi Arabia, uniting these different um, Bedouin tribes, and essentially Wahhabism is counterposed to the ideology of the Axis of Resistance, which is not necessarily even Shia Islam, but it's many ways anti-imperialism it's a poor working class interpretation of islam uh, that is not as strict as wahhabi islam and uh, it's a really interesting um concept and really interesting contradiction right uh, understanding wahhabism yeah. and i think it's important to to mention that so i'm going to just play a clip of uh, an attempt by bourgeois media to explain uh what hezbollah is and this is Again, from our favorite uh, buddies over at the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, they have a YouTube channel uh, where you can find a lot of Zionist propaganda uh, about Hezbollah. I'm going to play this and then we'll talk about uh, the roots and the origins of uh, Hezbollah. Shalom, sure. Lieutenant Colonel Scheffler here. I'm standing at the Israel-Lebanon border. In this beautiful place, Hezbollah conducts acts of terror. They try to execute horrific terror attacks across this border against civilians, living right here. In July 2006, Hezbollah infiltrated across this border, killing five soldiers and kidnapping two of the bodies. This is how Hezbollah instigated the Second Lebanon War. For 34 days, Hezbollah fired thousands of rockets at civilians here in their home. At the same time, Hezbollah used the people of southern Lebanon as human shields, endangering their lives. This constitutes a double war crime, aiming at civilians while hiding behind civilians. Following these acts of terror, the UN Security Council Resolution 1701 required full disarmament of Hezbollah. The world hoped Hezbollah's malign acts would stop the security situation would stabilize and the people of Lebanon and Israel would be safe. Sadly, this didn't happen. Instead, Hezbollah and other terrorist organizations in Lebanon continued to harm both nations. In 2015, Hezbollah fired an anti-tank missile at Sheba Farms, killing two IDF soldiers. In 2018, the IDF exposed terror tunnels dug by Hezbollah to be utilized by Radwan Hezbollah Commando Terror Forces to infiltrate into Israel and kill civilians. Then, in 2019, Hezbollah operatives fired anti-tank missiles across the border and attempted an armed infiltration. In 2020, Hezbollah operatives fired into Israel territory toward the IDF and into northern Israel. Today, the people of Lebanon are suffering from an ongoing crisis, an economic, humanitarian, and security crisis. Hezbollah is enhancing this crisis, abusing the dire situation. Hezbollah's action on both sides of this border hurt us all. The IDF is determined to protect the stability and safety of the region. Today, 15 years since the Second Lebanon War, we continue to guard this border and defend our civilians. We continue to believe and hope for peace. 
Count on the IDF to uh, defend and bring stability to the Middle East, according to the, to these idiots. Um, again, more propaganda about Hezbollah. One of the things that's interesting is kind of playing into some of the racist chauvinist attitudes that a lot of Zionists have toward Arab people is that they're just these erratic, crazy people who just can't stop bombing for no reason and no context whatsoever as to how Hezbollah came about, why they're defending themselves against Israel. Uh, why don't you tell us, Jay, a little bit about your thoughts on Hezbollah and how they came about as a form of resistance to Zionism, especially uh, against Israel. They're so close, especially uh, to the so-called state of Israel. Well, what happened is that uh, Lebanon had a very large Palestinian population that had been kicked out of Jordan um, uh, after Black September, which is uh, 1971, I believe. Um, and actually, I might just look that up, but it doesn't really matter. I mean, it, like large uh, Palestinian population in uh, in Lebanon, and that became the headquarters of the PLO. Uh, the PLO was then involved in in a in a power struggle within Lebanon. So it was like the Palestinians and the Lebanese left on one side versus the uh, the Christian right wing on the other side. And uh, you know, the Christian right wing uh, counted on on the Israelis to eventually invade. Uh, and so the Israelis occupied the southern part of Lebanon and they proceeded to fight against the PLO and eventually the PLO were expelled. And uh, but the thing is, the Israelis continued to to occupy South Lebanon uh, for about 18 years. And it's in that 18 year period that Hezbollah emerged as a resistance organization to fight against the Israeli occupation. Uh, Israel was finally ejected in 2000. Um, and then six years later, Israel invaded again and uh, Hezbollah beat them. Now, I mean, Israel will say that it was uh, it was instigated by Hezbollah capturing those, uh, uh, you know, infiltrating across the border, killing a few soldiers and capturing them. But at the same time, I mean, Israel had also captured, you know, plenty of had plenty of uh, Lebanese prisoners of war as well as Palestinian prisoners of war. Um, and so what Hezbollah was aiming for was a prisoner swap. Uh, but I do remember at that time, back in 2005, before even that that infiltration had happened, um, Israel was talking about the need to enter Lebanon and disarm Hezbollah, essentially wipe it out, uh, and then, you know, retreat back to Israel because they did not want Hezbollah to continue uh, operating in, in southern Lebanon and for southern Lebanon in particular to be a base of, of resistance against Israel because Hezbollah, the other thing that they do is they do support the Palestinian resistance, you know, so Hamas which uh, betrayed the resistance axis in 2011-2012, uh, um, and also the Palestinian Islamic Jihad. I mean, where do they get their weapons from? It's because of, uh, of, of Hezbollah you know, smuggling networks, and also Hezbollah has been training them as well. Uh, so, you know, when you see propaganda like that, I mean, they're looking at it from the Israeli perspective, which assumes that Israel is a legitimate state. And it simply isn't in the eyes of uh, the people of that region. So Syria, Lebanon, the Palestinians, because from their historic memory, they remember a time when you could go from Beirut to Jerusalem or Damascus to Jerusalem uh, without needing a passport. It was all part of the same contiguous geography. And so if you're in that kind of, if you inherit that historic memory and then a group of foreigners, settlers who are from, you know, Ukraine and Poland uh, come mm -hmm. to your country, take it over and say, look, this land belongs to us because our ancestors lived here 3000 years ago then you're not going to take too kindly to that and you're not going to recognize that state as being legitimate. Now, obviously, because Israel is a powerful state, and there was a faction in Lebanon, the Christian right, that said, we don't want to fight this country. We want peace with them. Whereas Hezbollah represents the, the side that says, no, like we are part of a broader, uh, broader Syrian Arab resistance against this entity uh, that has brought nothing but death and destruction to our region. And so as outsiders, I mean, I can I can respect the people in Lebanon that say, look, we don't want to fight Israel. We want peace with them. Right. Because they're the ones that have to deal with the consequences. But I also have an obligation to restrain the hand of the West in supporting Israel. And that's my primary obligation. Wow. Yeah, it's crazy because I think a lot of times a lot of Zionist propaganda is intended to lower the stakes. And what I mean by that is saying, like, OK, we recognize we can't fully conquer the land of Palestine. So we'll try to opt for a two-state solution. We'll try to opt for raising our, our asking price down. It's kind of like when you're haggling with somebody. And a lot of times, you know, you have other Western countries that will say, okay, we support both Palestine or Israel. They'll take a middle-of-the-road approach. And Hezbollah is like, nope, we don't recognize y'all. Get the <laughs> fuck out of Palestine. Palestine is the only nation that we recognize. 
Yeah, I just wanted to add one more thing. I mean, my position on Israel can actually be summarized as being exactly the same as uh, the position of Israel's first prime minister, David Ben-Gurion, when he said, uh, if I were an Arab leader, I would never accept the state of Israel. Uh, why Why would I? You know, like they've come and they've taken our country. Why should I accept that if I were an Arab leader? Like he blatantly said that, and I tend to agree. So my yeah. position is the same position as that of the first prime minister of Israel. <laughs> Is it, that's right. And uh, David ben, uh, ben Gurion, I mean, he was one of those, one of those demonic, evil people that he just said it st straight out. Like he was one of those people, Zionists, because there's some Zion, liberal Zionists, like the New York Times people, like the CNN people, that they're like, oh, okay, the the two state solution, the conflict. Uh, David Ben Gurion and the Likud type, the hard right Zionist people. They're just straight up. They're like, yeah, we're going in there. We're invading. If I was them, I wouldn't welcome us, but we're taking their shit anyway. Uh, so it's eye opening. Yeah. I just read a whole history of Zionism recently. I did a stream about it a few days ago, and um, it's crazy to see, like, hear his quotes directly. He has a lot of uh, gems like that that he says. Um, and I think it's, you know, with uh, Hezbollah as well, I think one thing that's important to mention is that a lot of times when we're talking about uh, different grassroots resistance movements, you know, we think of ragtag groups or groups that don't have a lot of resources, but uh, Hezbollah, like in many ways, is more powerful than the Lebanese uh, armed forces. I, to, if correct me if I'm wrong, I think they're actually bigger uh, than the than the Lebanese army. Is that is that right? Or or they have I don't, more? I don't know if they're bigger, but I can definitely say that uh, yeah. the average Hezb soldier has a greater willingness to die, and that's what counts yeah. on the battlefield. Most definitely. And 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 they just have such a well-structured uh, system where they're helping people, especially during the recent, uh, a few months ago, I want to say like four or five months ago, when there's a lot of economic turmoil in Lebanon because of uh, the sanctions and how they're targeting Iran. Uh, Hezbollah does a lot of community service work as well, feeding the poor. So they just brand them as people who are just going around shooting Israel and doing all this crazy stuff. But in a way, Hezbollah, for many Lebanese people, is a support network of poor working class families to deliver food, to deliver oil. And I think it's important to mention that because a lot of times they're just branded as uh, gun-toting to gun terrorists who uh, just want to go around and terrorizing people. Uh, moving into uh, Yemen, I know Yemen is, yes. is, is, a, is a nation that you've written quite a lot about. We have Ansar Allah, again, the Champions of God, a really awesome name, by the way, Champions of God. And uh, in mainstream media, they're called the Houthis, but uh, to my understanding, Houthis is not the correct term that they that they identify with, that they use, uh, because it's just the name of the, the leader. But basically, uh, a lot of the Houthi movement in Yemen is predominantly uh, Zaidi Shia, but they have also non-Shias and all sorts of Yemeni people uh, in the Houthi movement. Uh, the insurgency basically has its roots in 2004, but in many ways picked up within the last decade, especially in the war against the Saudi invasion, you have to remember people that Saudi Arabia has been bombing the crap out of Yemen for years, unchecked, and sometimes multiple times a day, multiple times a week, and no talk about it in mainstream media. Uh, millions of people who have died, who have been starved, who have uh, been killed. Um, and so I'm going to play a clip uh, of, again, you know, just some of the mainstream media talking points about, uh, Answer a lot. This clip in particular is from 2000, uh, January uh, 2021, last year. Uh, so basically, under the last month of the Trump administration, they designated Answer a lot as a quote unquote foreign terror group. Uh, the Biden administration, to my understanding, has since rolled that back. Uh, but here are some of the, the main talking points about that, and then we'll talk more about uh, Answer a lot. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said on Sunday that he plans to designate Yemen's Houthi movement as a foreign terrorist organization. The Houthis are the de facto authority in northern Yemen, and aid agencies have to work with them to deliver assistance. But diplomats and aid groups say the Trump administration's decision to blacklist the Iran-backed group could block the flow of aid to combat the world's largest humanitarian crisis a famine that top U.N. officials say affects millions of people. It could also threaten regional peace talks the U.N. has been trying to revive to end the war between a Saudi Arabia-led military coalition that intervened in Yemen in 2015, fighting alongside government forces against the Houthis. The Trump administration has been piling on sanctions related to Iran in recent weeks, 
which some analysts say is a push to make it harder for the incoming Biden administration to re-engage with Iran and rejoin an international nuclear agreement. A former U.S. ambassador to the Middle East, Ryan Crocker, warned that the Houthis are an integral part of Yemeni society and criticized the plan. This move serves no interest at all. This is making a strategic enemy out of a local force that has been part of Yemen for generations. They are not Iranian pawns. So pretty interesting that even somebody within the U.S. government is saying that. Uh, Comrade Jay, you know, your analysis of Ansar Allah and the importance of raising attention about the situation in Yemen. I'll give you a quick rundown of Yemeni history. So um, Yemen used to be divided into north and south. Uh, the north um, had, there was a time when the north and the south were ruled by uh, two really amazing modernizing progressive leaders. In the north, there was Ibrahim al-Hamdi and in the south, there was Salim al-Rubai. And they were both discussing the prospects of unification. That's when uh, the Saudis decided to uh, orchestrate the assassination of, uh, of the northern leader, um, uh, uh, Ibrahim al-Hamdi. And then after they assassinated him, this paved the way for the 34-year reign of Ali Abdullah Saleh. And uh, he was eventually deposed in the Arab Spring in 2011. Uh, but then he was deposed in such a way that uh, the Saudis and the Americans intervened to replace him with uh, basically his vice president, Abdul Rabb Mansour Hadi. They then uh, held an election with only Hadi's name on the ballot. Um, and then Hadi was expected to, um, to, to implement uh, like a set of reforms that, uh, that, uh, that recognize the grievances of Ansarullah, but also the Southern Movement, as well as the Islam Party, which is the Yemeni Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, but he ended up pushing two things that were extremely unpopular in Yemen. One was the federalization of the country into six regions with incredible autonomy for all of them so that the resource rich regions with small populations would have autonomy from the state. And, you know, the, the, the parts of Yemen that have the largest populations, like in, in no the northern Yemeni wedge has about 80 percent of the population. The southern part of Yemen has about 20 percent. But all the resources are in the southern part. So the federalization of Yemen was to benefit Saudi Arabia. They, they were the ones that were pushing for it. Um, and so he pushed for that. Uh, and, uh, and he also uh, cut the subsidies on fuel, which caused uh, prices to increase by 200%. And it's because of these policies that uh, Ansarullah was able to take over the capital Sana'a in a relatively bloodless uh, revolution. I mean, what happened in, in Sana'a is what uh, Turkey was hoping, hoping would have happened in, Yemen, in, in Syria. You know, like the, the countries that were arrayed against Syria, they were hoping that, you know, the, the army, which is a majority conscript army in both Syria and Yemen, that the army would defect to the side of the so-called revolution. In Syria, that didn't happen. The army stayed loyal to President Bashar al-Assad, and they fought against the Free Syrian Army, which eventually joined forces with al-Qaeda, and then from uh, al-Qaeda, Islamic State emerged, and, and they eventually defeated them. Whereas in Yemen, the army and the state... The, the interior ministry, as well as the former president, Ali Abdullah Saleh, defected to the side of the, of the Ansarullah revolution. Uh, and so that's why Ansarullah was able to seize power in a relatively bloodless process. Now, it has to be remembered, you mentioned uh, that in 2004, um, that's when like Ansarullah emerged. Uh, people have to remember this one very important fact. Ansarullah never took up arms against the Yemeni state. The Yemeni state took up arms against Ansarullah. The Yemeni state under Ali Abdullah Saleh um, was responding to a political challenge with brutal military force. And so they entered uh, the northern regions of Yemen. Uh, they entered Saada and they murdered the leader of Ansarullah back then. His name is Hussein al-Houthi. And, uh, and it was a grisly massacre. You know, they, they, burnt, they burnt him alive in a cave along with his uh, friends and family members. It was horrific. Um, and, you know, the reason is because the Saudis who were backing Ali Abdullah Saleh, uh, they uh, have always seen uh, the Houthi ideology as being uh, contrary to their own ideology of Wahhabism. Because, you know, people try and understand Wahhabism as like you mentioned before, it's like it's a strict ideology or something or it's extreme. Let's understand it as Marxist, right? On the one hand, let's say you have on the one hand Wahhabism and the, on the other hand, you have uh, Zaidi Islam. Politically, these are polar opposites because with uh, Wahhabism, they emphasize uh, Islamic scholars like uh, Ibn Taymiyyah, Ghazali, 
um, and these people say something, and uh, and Ahmad ibn Hanbal as well, which is like you know one of the early earlier scholars. And one uh, one of their principles that 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 you see in, with all these three scholars is uh, that it's that sixty years under an oppressive tyrant is preferable to a single night of anarchy. So the idea is that you should put up with an oppressive tyrant because it's better than the anarchy that would follow if that oppressive tyrant were to be overthrown. Whereas Zaidi Islam basically says that Muslims have an obligation to rebel against corrupt and unjust rulers. So you have this total, totally opposite attitude towards power, right? And so the yeah. Saudis fear that, that Zaidi ideology infused with Arab nationalism would take over Yemen. Uh, and then that would undermine their own state. Because we have to remember that the southern parts of Saudi Arabia are actually Yemen. Uh, so when we look at the southern provinces of Baha, Asir, Jizan, and Najran, historically, these are Yemeni territories. And the only reason they were incorporated into the modern Saudi state is because of Saudi aggression. That's why. Because yeah. the Saudis had the backing of the British. That's why. Um, and so what happened under, I mean, that period when after the, the assassination of North Yemen's great president, um, Ibrahim al-Hamdi, uh, was that, you know, it was a, a counter-revolution. 34 years under Ali Abdullah Saleh, Yemen became Wahhabiized. Saudi Arabia promoted that with money and, and they just promoted Wahhabi ideology. The Saudis, like, uh, expelled this Yemeni preacher called uh, Mukbil bin Hadi al wadiai and he set up a center in, in the north of Yemen, in the Zaidi heartlands, uh, um, called uh, Dar al-Hadith al kathriya and uh, in this center, um, you know, he was he was just promoting Wahhabi ideology. And so Zaidism was kind of losing its influence because the Wahhabis were the ones that had all the money. They had all these foreign students coming in. Even in my home state of Kerala in India, there's a lot of people like Muslims because Kerala, where I'm from, has 28 percent Muslim population. And so a lot of Muslims would go to Yemen to, to, to learn Wahhabi ideology. And so one interesting quote from from uh, Mukbil bin Hadi al wadiai is he said that um, uh, the independence of South Yemen from British imperial rule was a bad thing because it replaced um, uh, Britain, British rule with an atheistic communist government. So he was basically saying that British rule was, was preferable to the socialists wow. in South Yemen taking back their country from British rule, right? Uh, and that's because the, the the strategy that the Saudis had for Yemen was that they would take the northern wedge of Yemen and the British would take the southern wedge. And today you see this exact same division of Yemen uh, being kind of, uh, you know, resurrected, except now it's uh, the UAE that's asserting dominance over, over the southern part of Yemen. And it's Saudi Arabia that's uh, that's trying to take control over northern Yemen, but they can't because of the resistance of the Ansarullah movement. I mean, these people have really suffered, you know, for the just for the right of Yemen to become an independent country. Like, uh, you know, it's it's three hundred and seventy seven thousand Yemenis have died since 2015. Seventy wow. percent were kids under the age of five. Sixty percent died of starvation and disease. And because the West is complicit, nobody cares. But they care about, uh, you know, Ukraine, where maybe like a maximum of like, you know, a thousand, two thousand people have died because of the Russian invasion. And it is technically an invasion. I don't deny that. It's crazy the thing, the situation with Yemen, because I think a lot of times it's similar to Haiti in Latin America. Haiti is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere and has been colonized and redivided by imperialism for centuries. And they're still paying reparations, quote unquote, to France for liberating themselves in 1804. And Yemen, in a way, reminds me of Haiti, what Haiti is to the Western Hemisphere, where you have these horrible human rights violations. You have people dying, people being starved to death. You have all these radical uh, groups going in and killing people. Uh, and yet no attention is going there because of the the way, the view that many people have of Yemenis or Haiti as just being poor. It's always been like that. It's always been crazy. Uh, but Yemen historically has had a very thriving uh, historic uh, civilization for thousands of years. And even geopolitically, Yemen, like, this is one of the reasons why I like looking at maps, because it also helps clear up why certain powers are in certain countries of the world. Uh, looking at Yemen, one thing that I can't help but notice is that Yemen has a lot of access to that very tight corridor of the Red Sea, where so much of the trade flows through that mm. you, you were talking about Europe, the Western uh, imperialist powers, 
the it has access to the Arabian Sea. And I know that in that area of Eastern Africa, the Horn of Africa and Yemen, uh, the U.S. and AFRICOM has been ramping up its presence. They want to control that region because if you control the Red Sea, if you control the trade going in there, you can control the global economy. And I just wanted to ask you if that certainly plays a role. And where do you see oh, now right. moving forward um, the the role of Ansar Allah? Uh, does it seem like they're having more momentum? Will they be able to do not unite the country and actually re successfully resist Saudi Arabia? Like what's going to happen? Because a lot of this is also dependent on the Saudi royal family, uh, which it seems like they're kind of in a more destabilized place. So um, what do you think about that? Well, you know, they're, they're taking back territory. Um, the, much of the north is under the control of the Ansarullah-backed National Salvation Government of Yemen, which is like what it's actually called, the National Salvation Government of Yemen, because, I mean, Ansarullah is a militia that fights alongside the Yemeni army. They're not rebelling against the Yemeni army. One thing that has to be remembered is that, you know, this war is actually legal. Uh, according to according to the UN, and that's because of UN Resolution 2216. Uh, this resolution basically said that the Saudis were acting on behalf of the Yemeni government, even though the Yemeni, even though the 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 president of this so-called Yemeni government, uh, um, which is Hadi, the former president of Yemen, he had resigned. So he had resigned in January 2015. Then in April 2015, the Saudis. Um, uh, convinced uh, the UN Security Council to table this motion. The motion was tabled by France, the UK, and the US. And the motion said that the Saudis were acting on behalf of Hadi, the president of Yemen, even though he had resigned. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, China and Russia could have vetoed that resolution, but they chose not to, thereby legalizing this, uh, this genocidal war against Yemen. And, you know, most recently, China and, uh, and Russia actually voted to support the extension of the arms embargo on, on Yemen, which prevents the, uh, the, the Ansarullah-backed government from receiving weapons to defend themselves against the Saudi invasion, which is 84% foreign mercenaries. So the side in Yemen that calls itself the official government is like 84% foreign, whereas the side that's 100% indigenous, which is the Yemeni uh, resistance, like you know, with Ansarullah at its, at its center, is referred to as Iranian-backed proxies. Um, so you asked me the question, you know, what do I see? Uh, I, th I see the Yemenis holding territory um, uh, and, and like, the, the battle line's not really budging. But I also see an incredible opportunity right now because of the, uh, the, the Ukraine war. And that is because we have to ask ourselves, you know, because we have to think strategically as like, you know, leftists in the West so that we can get our messaging out so that we can be as effective as possible. So that we're not just like, you know, uh, you know, uh, um, obsessing with our own moral purity, which is what a lot of leftists do. This is a very, very important point. Um, Saudi Arabia and Russia have been collaborating on oil prices ever since the war on Yemen began. And that's because... For both countries, having high oil prices is a good thing because they're both oil exporters. Now, of course, they have differences in terms of like what oil price they prefer because they have different costs of production. Um, but uh, but they've definitely definitely been coordinating. Um, so OPEC plus Russia have been like you know deciding what the price of oil is going to be. Um, and so I think Russia, the reason why they betrayed Yemen back in 2015. Uh, and China as well is because okay for Russia it's because they they needed to collaborate on oil prices for China it's because they rely on Saudi oil um, and so for that reason they were willing to to stab Yemen in the back now we're in a situation where um, Russia and uh, Saudi Arabia they both need high oil prices in order to pay for their wars right Saudi Arabia benefits from the oil prices going up because it means that they're going to have more of a budget. This war has cost Saudi Arabia alone, not including the UAE, it's cost them $324 billion since the beginning of operations in March 2015. And that's because um, never, never before in history have so many ballistic missiles been used. And th the reason is actually quite funny. It's because... You know, the Saudis are using missiles, interceptor missiles that cost about $4 million each to shoot down Yemeni Ansarullah drones that cost about $200 to $1,000 each. So think about the equation there. The yeah. Yemenis are able to, the Yemeni resistance is able to spend $200 to $1,000 to force the Saudis to spend $4 million. 
And that's why the Saudis have spent $324 billion, which is the equivalent of about two years worth of oil exports from like 2018 to 2019. If the oil prices go up, then it makes it easier and cheaper for the Saudis to wage this war against Yemen. Now, the Russians also need oil prices to stay up in order to prosecute their war in the Ukraine, which like I'm not really... I'm not really kind of opposed. I mean, I can understand from Russia's point of view. I mean, there's fascists there and whatnot, but we're not going to get into Ukraine, right? It's a separate, separate topic. But here's a situation where we in the West can actually say, hey, look, if you in the West want cheaper oil prices, then there's one way that you can do it, which is you have to convince the Saudis to stop the war on Yemen. That way, the Saudis will have a lot more money, and that way they'd be able to afford to drop the price of oil, Right. Because it's the, the main cost for the Saudi economy right now is waging war against Yemen. But if they stop waging war against Yemen, then they'd be able to drop the price of oil, uh, which would be good for the Yemenis. It would be bad for Russia. You know, So why not, yeah. if you're going to be anti-Russia, right? if you're going to say we have to hurt the Russians, <laughs> why not help the Yemenis right? Damn. in the process of hurting the Russians, which is my, my argument? Yeah, no, it's. Uh, I'm glad you broke it down in terms of economics. And it's really... Uh, good to know that the economics of it as Marxists, we always have to center our analysis as to follow the money and why are things happening? And they're happening because of changes in the economy and interest of imperialism and in particular with oil. Um, so I'm, I'm glad you broke that down. And that's really fascinating. And I really hope that in the future, Yemen can finally have peace, prosperity and stability uh, with Ansar Lat at the, the helm of the leadership, because the way things are going now, I mean, you have more people dying, you have so many hungry children, you have innocent lives being lost. And I think Yemen is one of those nations that unfortunately is not getting enough attention and, and solidarity from the left. So um, and I think they form a, definitely a crucial part of the axis of resistance because they're not, not only calling out Saudi uh, aggression, but they're also calling out a Western imperialism and how the world has turned a shoulder to the people of Yemen. So I think that Yemen continues to be very inspiring for us as communists and, and people around the world. Uh, we won't have time to get into a full in-depth into the popular mobilization forces in Iraq, but maybe, uh, 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 Comrade, if you just want to wrap up by giving us your thoughts, anything in particular about Iraq and how it has played a central role in the axis of resistance in particular with some of the uh, the groups that have fought against uh, Islamic State, Daesh, uh, and also just overall your view on the axis of resistance and why, uh, as communists, that we should begin to pay more attention to it, uh, what's going on. I mean, yeah, I don't think I could get into the to the popular mobilization units other than to say that, you know, they are they are heroes in Iraq because they defended that country from Islamic State, which is on the verge of taking over Baghdad. Um but, uh, you know, we in the West have to recognize that we live in a country that has committed a genocide against that region. You know, millions of people have been killed because of Western policies. Our obligation as, you know, leftist, communist, socialist, whatever, is not to give advice to these movements or to chastise them or to, like, have a, have a kind of scorecard. You know, it's like, oh, you know, I think you're, I think you're eight out of ten in terms of your your ranking of like socialism or something like that, right? That's right. not our job. Our job swipe is right, to restrain, <laughs> our job is to restrain the the hand of the empire that's destroying these countries, but also to recognize that the working classes in the West don't have an interest in these wars either. Uh, these are bankers' wars. These are wars that represent the interests of the arms companies. Um, you know, the working class in the United States has an interest in ending the system of U.S. currency hegemony so they can have a chance to reindustrialize, so they can bring back the industries that they've lost because of this currency hegemony. Um, so I'm not one of those crude third worlders who thinks that the interests of the West and the interests of the third world are, you know, totally contradictory and they can't be reconciled. Um, I, I do believe that it's the interests of the Western capitalist class uh, that has to be challenged within uh, within the West, um, and that it's it's this capitalist class, particularly the financial oligarchy, that benefits from from these wars uh, against the Middle East. Uh, but it's also the Israel lobby. You know, Israel has its own independent reasons for because it feels insecure in that part of the world because it's an illegitimate state in the eyes of many of the countries surrounding it. So it feels the need to destabilize and destroy every single surrounding nation. So the question that people in the West have to ask is, are you willing to pay the price for that? Because, you know, we 
have we get the refugee inflows, right? Like the West has to pay for it. I mean, Israel is not going to open its borders to these refugees, right? Because they want to have yeah. an ethno state, you know. But it's it's people in Germany, France, you know, that have to cop this influx of refugees. And so the West has been suffering from these wars as well, you know. So we have to turn our turn our eyes at the real real enemies within the West. It's the financial oligarchy and it's the Israel lobby. Most definitely, man. I, I really appreciate that. Uh, such a great breakdown. I know I appreciate that because it's a lot to tackle. I know it's kind of asking for a lot because we're talking about so many different countries. But I think you did a great job at kind of recapping each country and each movement uh, that form part of this broader axis of resistance. And I appreciate it. Please subscribe to uh, Comrade Jay's channel, uh, The Oriental Despot. The link is in the description. He has great breakdowns. If you want some more in-depth into the, these different topics, in particular Yemen, uh, please check out his channel. Jay is a PhD candidate who's currently studying theories of imperialism as they relate to the wars of the 21st century in the Arab world. Also involved with the Hands Off Syria movement based in Sydney, Australia. Uh, Jay, anything you want to plug or mention before you head out, man? Victory to Yemen. Long live <laughs> Yemen. Not. Victory to Yemen. Beautiful, beautifully said, man. Uh, thank you so much, comrade. I hope to have you back on soon. And we're going to go out to some revolutionary music from Iran and Lebanon. Peace out, everybody. Have a great weekend. Take care. Peace. سعودی بیرون زده از هنجره شاه سعودی تکفیری و بهابی و داعش شده هم دست اینها همه زیر سر شیطان بزرگ تا روح خدا در دل این خاک دمیده تا روح خدا در دل این خاک دمیده دشمن به خودش یک شب آرام ندیده دشمن به خودش یک شب آرام ندیده کم کم همه جا میر صدای حسینی بین المللی میشود این ارس خمینی آرام و قرار همه کف به هم خود بیداری اسلامی دنیا که رقم خود با ما سخن از جنگ منگو ما که نموردی ما پا سخنتان را به دم تیغ سپردی از منطق ما هست شده واجه تسلیم در شام و اراق و یمن آماده جنگی در شام و اراق و یمن آماده جنگی برای قلب تلاوی که سجیل بباره پردان که دم هیدری از کعب براید پردان که دم هیدری از کعب براید دوران ما آبی سفت ها به سراید این پرچم چی از که بر قله دنیا هر کس علی دم بزن از هموطن ما یا هی در کر را زند نقش به زودی یا هی در کر را زند نقش به زودی یا هی در کر را زند نقش به زودی بر پرچم سبز عربستان سعودی بر پرچم سبز عربستان سعودی هی در هی در
Al-Ad